welcome to all the friends uh, and colleagues uh, of this uh, panel that is uh, uh, about uh, our academy today, uh, which is important to know what is the past, uh, makes us to understand uh, our present uh, and better plan uh, our future. Our uh, panel is going to last uh, 90 minutes uh, as planned, uh, and uh, each participant uh, has uh, five minutes uh, uh, speaking time. We are also in the academy, very many different uh, people, and uh, we incredibly are able to collaborate effectively uh, together. In my opinion, also, we went a long way, 60 years, as a matter of fact. But uh, certainly, uh, there is uh, no pretension that we are perfect. Actually, we can improve uh, a lot. Uh, uh, for example, we are a World Academy, but we do not have uh, enough people representing the five continents. We are a World Academy. But uh, compared with the white uh, European uh, and uh, North American men, we have a uh, much less uh, women, and uh, also we have much less uh, exponent uh, of art, for example. So uh, as uh, we go along, uh, we can uh, always uh, improve uh, our ability to represent all the stakeholders. Uh, and now that we have uh, in, in incredible amounts uh, of partners, uh, including uh, our collaboration with the United Nations, but uh, more are coming and some uh, will be uh, uh, presenting themselves in some of the session. So, worry, I see uh, Neboisha and uh, uh, Mila. So Neboisha, would you please uh, go ahead uh, and Stefan also. Okay, thank you, Alberto. I intend to give you a brief information on an event I consider important to the future of uh, WAS. Namely, following the initiative of the Union for Pure and Applied Physics, the General Conference of UNESCO decided in, 20, in November 2019 to proclaim the year of 2022 as the International Year of Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development. The series of events to be organized within the International Year has been founded by a number of additional international unions and organizations and supported by many science academies, learned societies, and scientific networks worldwide, including WAS. The opening ceremony of the series events will take place in Geneva in the beginning of 2022. It will be organized by the steering committee of the International Year in partnership with the UN office at Geneva and the European Organization for Nuclear Research, CERN. One of the planned events within the International Year will be the World Conference on basic sciences and sustainable development, which will be held in September 2022 in Belgrade, Serbia. The proposal was given by WAS and it has been accepted by the steering committee. The institutions organizing the conference are UNESCO, WAS, the Serbian Academy of Sciences and Arts, the Club of Rome, the Serbian Association of Economists, the World University Consortium, and the Vincha Institute of Nuclear Sciences in Belgrade. The program and organizing committees of the conference have been formed and they commenced the preparation activities leading to the event. We expect, we the organizers, that the preparations of the conference and the event itself with its scientific and artistic programs will be a significant contribution to strengthening the membership of the academy 
and the role of basic scientists in its future activities. That has been all I wanted to say. Thank you very much, Alberto. Uh, so you generously uh, share some of your minutes uh, with uh, the next uh, speaker. Hey, Emile, are you ready to speak? Uh, dear friends, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Emil Constantinescu. I am former president of Romania between uh, 1996 uh, 2000, and currently the president of the Scientific Council of the Institute for Advanced Study in uh, Levant uh, Culture and Civilization. I am also Professor Emeritus of Geology at the University of Bucharest. It's, uh, it is an honor and a pleasure to be here today and uh, party in this uh, retrospective of the World Academy of Art of Science, which is uh, now uh, 60 years old. The moment of uh, talking about uh, the World Academy of Art of Science uh, Today cannot be more perfect uh, as we are now at the crossroad when um, the world needs uh, aspirational leadership, guidance, technical know-how and uh, constant reinforcement of our uh, humanity. The old Academy of Art of Science uh, was born at the time uh, when the whole world uh, was striving towards uh, achieving nuclear safety in the form of the treaties and agreements uh, between uh, all the relevant actors. Although the World Academy of Art of Science has dedicated a large part of uh, its activity to nuclear security in the beginning years uh, of its existence, this um, has not been the Academy's uh, raison d'etre. The reason for its existence was uh, to advance the role of knowledge in the evolution of global uh, society. Another key element uh, of the Academy uh, development um, was the transdisciplinary knowledge and education an aspect I support uh, as an academic. Uh, this is visible in the many projects and the conferences organized by uh, uh, World Academy of Art of Science lately. The central uh, topic of interest of the, of the Academy are focused uh, on human welfare and well-being, attempting to discuss uh, issues uh, related to peace and security, freedom, justice, and equality, economic security and prosperity, ecological sustainability, knowledge, and creativity. Um, a central point uh, resolved also around the work of academia and how it can impact the evolution of today's society. The World Academy of Art of today is a natural result of its uh, 60 years of evolution and of time of the constant involvement in the most pressing issues of humanity. Also, sporting a highly academic background, today's academy is interested in developing more human-centered projects. And you, Alberto. Uh, is to dedicate uh, this activity, uh, you know it, uh, it better. That can influence life and its core and uh, produce change. It is uh, noteworthy that along its classical academic approach, the World Academy is uh, practicing a hands on the matter style, visible to the many projects uh, it has engaged in, especially the latest global leadership in the 21st century. We need uh, such a practical approach, especially in light of the recent crisis uh, we have all been struggling with, uh, that is a COVID-19 uh, pandemic. I am proud to chair 
the Academy's first center of excellence. The Institute of Advanced Study in Levant Culture and Civilization in Bucharest established in November uh, 2017. The Institute has already created several annual events as the annual School of Byzantine Studies um, and international journals, Levant Studies, uh, and published a few volumes of interest to those working on the history, the culture, and civilization of the former Levant area. We are currently working uh, simultaneously on ancient, modern, and contemporary history projects, including also anticipatory history. One of our recent uh, projects, it has dedicated to a multidisciplinary approach to the current pandemic entitled the world post-COVID-19 pandemic, a humanist vision for a sustainable development. This is a project to which the Academy contributed extensively, which uh, write and pieces and participation in the events we organize. Also, I look forward to presenting it uh, extensively on Wednesday at a dedicated panel together with uh, Thomas Reuter, uh, uh, Stefan Brunhuber, uh, Fadwa El Gindi, Winston Nagan, uh, and many other fellows and friends uh, of the uh, Academy. To conclude, uh, today's uh, challenges are multiple and we need to address them in a complementary manner, not leaving aside any factor that can be of assistance, be it theoretical or practical. Furthermore, we need to address uh, the root causes in order to be able to uh, treat the effects. Uh, and we need a group of debate to gather blind uh, minds and entrepreneurial spirit to deeply discuss causes, effects, and uh, appropriate uh, treatment. The World Academy of Art of Science has provided uh, this framework so far, and uh, we as fellows, associate of junior, as well as, uh, as uh, trustees, need to keep uh, fueling its engines for, uh, for it to continue being such a framework of debate in the future. Thank you and good luck uh, to us all. Thank you very much, uh, Emil. Thank you. And now, Mila, Mila Popovic, please. Thank you so much, Alberto. It's wonderful to be here and congratulations to all the generation past, uh, present that are serving yeah, the academy well. and the future ones that are coming to continue the legacy of the founding. Mary? I first of all want to honor the moment. Um, 60 years is a, a tremendous legacy to celebrate today. And for my introduction into the Academy in 2009 and 2010, I feel obliged to acknowledge some people and mark the moment that way uh, for my own personal experience in the Academy. First and foremost, I want to thank Ivo Schlaus who nominated me to be the member and has been the mentor since and a whole lineup of stellar mentors that I met, met over the years and worked with who have become uh, friends and more than mentors who have become dialogic friends and, and have taught me so much about leadership. People like Eitor Gurgulino de Souza, Gary Jacobs, of course, um, Federico Mayor, Hazel Henderson, and many more. So thank you very much for the work that I've been able to do with you and for all the learning for, uh, for my own personal evolution within the World Academy. Speaking of the present moment in the Academy and the past 10 years of my experience, I have seen an incredible intensification in the, in the energy behind the purpose and the mission of the Academy. I have also witnessed tremendous acceleration and the effectiveness we have been um, exercising in the way have, we have been implementing programs. And most importantly, in the way we have been connecting knowledge, connecting initiatives, and of course, convening social forces, institutional power, and organizational capacities of many organizations, particularly international organizations with whom we have partnered or have uh, conjoined initiatives with. That has been probably the greatest delight of my experience in the Academy to see the intensity, the acceleration, and the scope, the magnitude of growth 
both in membership, in programming, in partnership, and in mission going forward. And I would like for, to spend a minute to speak about the present moment, which has become the context for our programming, and to, of course, address the most immediate situation, which is the crisis in democracy, where we have seen tremendous pro progressive developments and also tremendous pushback by regressive forces. In that, uh, in that strife between the social forces, I think we stand a critical chance, in fact, to evolve to a higher level of order. I would say to a higher level of new order of care and support that we'd so desperately need in the context of another critical situation, which is the health crisis globally. That kind of shared vulnerability has shown to us, not only as Alberto has uh, pointed out, that we are fundamentally, essentially, existentially interconnected in a relational universe, but that we also need to rise to that sh shared vulnerability to take our programming, our collaborations, and our visions for the future towards healing the biosocial conflict on which we, all of our structures are based, towards going progressing forward to um, a shared futures that are beneficial for all the humanity. With that kind of understanding that we're facing multifaceted crises, where economic distress is coupled with health crisis, where we have crisis of democracy, as well as in education of an outdated system of education, we are really facing a, a hydra of many heads. And the only way we could rise forward is by rising in consciousness and collaboration, understanding that we can only go forward together. The world is not lacking knowledge. We are experiences, experiencing loss of knowledge where we are having lack of co collaboration. This is vital. As many of my colleagues and friends such as Jonathan Granov so poignantly and emotionally pointed out, um, we have got to co-evolve and we have got to go forward together. This is you know, persist, prevail or perish situation. Within this kind of context of shared vulnerabilities um, and uh, equally shared opportunities that we could create for going forward, um, some of the programming that we have developed is focused indeed on the global leadership in the 21st century. And I would like to take that forward to say that based on and building on the legacy, the tremendous noosphere and intellectual responsibility that we were left with by our founding members, we really need to be leaders for the 23rd century. Without that trajectory leading forward, without that kind of mindset, we don't stand a chance because we will end up practicing um, sustainability as damage control, not as art of living and evolving. And in that sense, we'll also continue practicing science in an irresponsible and destructive way. That is another legacy. And that is another um, program that our fellow and colleague Nebosha spoke about, what is the future of science? What is the new social responsibility of science granted the new socioeconomic and political conditions in which we're functioning? So global leadership needs to be taken forward. An another program and another um, initiative that the Academy is kind of co-building with global partners is the meta framework of human security that is, that we are, that is pressing need. It's a vital issue, but also a pressing need. And all the facets of human activity and association that are connected to the notion of human security, by which we hope to outgrow a very outdated notion of national security, even international security. With that, I would like to take that uh, framework even further to speak of planetary security and planetary multilateralism as our only future, as our only possible future. Uh, in that sense, once we understand what planetary security entails and what planetary multilateralism invites, we understand that vitally all life forms become the stakeholders in that kind of future. Um, another um, potential and program that we have proposed and are developing currently is the uh, project on global referendum, a, gl a potential global polling where um, we would survey and poll humanity on its pressing needs and also its highest aspirations for the future. 
This is not something new that we are doing, but what is unprecedented is being able to use modern technology to actually truly distribute the power of voting and go beyond national um, current experiences and, and methodologies of national voting to have a truly global humanities voice voting on its needs and aspirations. And in that sense, to actually initiate an unprecedented project of a global humanities um, self-reflexive exercise and paint a picture of humanities pressing needs that can go beyond conflict competition. And these are only some of the programs that we are developing in the spheres of social responsibility of science, transformation of finance and economies and economics, um, future education, global social transformation, and the fostering of the genius of individual as well as us as the collective, the genius of humanity. So thank I you. thank you for the time uh, that I've had over the course of these years with the Academy, hoping to continue working with many colleagues, uh, supporting all the projects that you will hear about over the course of the next five days, which is really exciting, understanding that we can only go forward if we go together. And in that sense, I really congratulate all the colleagues and uh, wish you a wonderful week of collaborations and co-evolving. Thank you, Mila. Thank you. Now, uh, I, Stefan, uh, I see you and uh, I'm sure you're fine. So uh, if you can uh, mute, uh, you have uh, five minutes. Uh, and uh, uh, then uh, we hope after you, Donato would be uh, able to function uh, also on video, please. Uh. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much for uh, organizing this conference. Uh, I'm shortly talking about WAS today. I've been involved in a project which is running since five years called the Tao Finance Initiative of WAS. And I would like to give you a short update of the last six weeks. Five years ago, we tried to um, come up with an international expert group trying to answer the question, how can we really finance our future? How can we finance our global commons? And how can we finance SDGs? And this project now comes to a momentum in the sense that we've been uh, going to publish our one of our reports coming out of this initiative. And I'm just going to give you a brief update of the last two or three months. We are now a member of the advisory board of um, the international blockchain community. We have ongoing meetings with the UN, with the European Investment Bank, with World Bank, IMF, and BIS. Last week, I had a meeting with the ISDA and Prime Finance. This is the, the 200 who is who in finance who would like to join in. I have ongoing meetings with academics and parliamentarians on a weekly and monthly basis. This morning, I got a feedback from the Global Solution Summit, which is the think tank of the G7, which feeds into political decision makings in this field. There are several uh, additional study papers coming out within the next months. We just started a marketing campaign and an international roadshow to bring down, to bring um, the ideas uh, um, uh, uh, on the country level. Together with members of the, of the World Academy, we are creating a, a graphic novel, which is available in a digital format. And uh, a short 80 pager is available already and financing our future is now uh, available through Postgrade Macmillan. Um, I would like to Finally, I refer that within the next couple of weeks and months, we have already dozens of invitations and talks on the simple question, how can we finance our common future? As Mila said, sustainability is not only about damage control, sustainability is much more than that. And finance and the way we create financial engineering securizations, the way we create our financial system in order to enable sustainability, to enable global commons, and to enable SDGs is one um, part of uh, this Tower Finance Initiative. And I'm very much looking forward to share more with you on that topic. Uh, and please do not hesitate to contact me. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And I'm looking forward for a fruitful um, 
fruitful uh, General Assembly for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. Very, very interesting and important topic. Uh, uh, now, I hope uh, that Donato can hear us. Uh, and WASH nowadays is really uh, a linchpin with so many, so many important events worldwide. Uh, and uh, the, the change in the participation that we are seeing in so many events uh, through uh, the United Nations system in particular, I mean, as you, as you have emphasized before, we are now involved in this very important program that is the global leadership for the 21st century. Uh, that is uh, really a, a research, but it's also a clear path that is coming out uh, from the research of uh, areas of work where uh, scientists and the politicians and economists can work together really for social transformation. Uh, so this is uh, really an unprecedented, um, an unprecedented level of uh, participation that we are having uh, through our partners, uh, through uh, multiple events that we have organized. And this is something that will continue. So it's a, a very important engagement, a social engagement that World Academy is contributing to and is also a platform that we have opened that is extremely uh, uh, extremely helpful we believe and that has uh, received um, a, a lot of support by many institutions the united nations uh, first of all uh, the second event the second the second uh, engagement that we are involved with, uh, it deals with human security. That is a concept that goes much beyond the personal security or, or, or health or, or personal status of individuals, but really it's linked to uh, the, um, not just the physical, but also the moral and uh, the economic opportunities that individuals have. Um, so through this uh, research that we are going to conduct, that we are now embarked on, uh, and uh, many uh, organizations are, are, now, uh, are, are now joining us in this particular endeavor, we count to um, aggregate many, uh, uh, not just individuals, but organizations, and come up with uh, a better understanding of what human security means, and therefore also uh, support this social change, the social change through uh, human security that is so much required. Uh, so these are the main, uh, uh, let's say, uh, engagements that we, are, we, have, we have embarked on uh, that require the full participation of uh, uh, WAS fellows, whether they are uh, politicians, they are experts in politics, uh, economists, scientists, and so on. Uh, as you said, we, uh, we are uh, convinced that all uh, um, expertise is relevant. And uh, as, uh, as it was said, I mean, the most important thing is to think about humanity uh, and we should forget all the rest when humanity uh, and this, the core of interest of humanity are at stake. Uh, so the, the research continues and um, we are definitely poised to, to have a, a, very, a, a very important um, process ahead of us uh, where all WAS fellows are invited to participate. Uh, we didn't see you, but uh, we heard you uh, very clearly. And uh, thank you for your contribution and all you do in it. Of course, uh, we just mentioned a few of the uh, you know, activities. We have uh, even created years ago uh, sister organization like uh, the World uh, Universe, University Consortium uh, that just uh, had uh, a new president uh, uh, and uh, we have uh, a session on that, uh, but uh, uh, we're going to have uh, another uh, World uh, Conference uh, on Education, uh, uh, the last one, uh, Neboisha uh, organized uh, in Belgrade. Uh, Neboisha, you also took 
very little time and illustrate that this is important uh, uh, new conference. Uh, would you like uh, to say a few more things uh, and that uh, is the invitation uh, to anybody interested uh, to contribute and to register to your to your or our uh, conference? Uh, thank you, Alberto. Uh, first of all, we are, there is, as I have said, uh, a, a program committee and core of that team has already started to collect the potential contributors. But uh, the program will be made uh, to cover basic sciences and sustainable development. We do not want to talk only on basic sciences for sustainable development. It is a chance to consider basic sciences themselves. When I say that, I mean mathematics, physics, chemistry, and biology. We shall also consider the interdisciplinary contributions of these four sciences. Then, uh, the connections of basic sciences with other sciences, innovation, and engineering and contributions of basic sciences to medicine and healthcare. Then con connections of basic sciences with energy technologies, climate action and protection of the environment. And finally, contributions of basic sciences to advanced education. Thus, we will begin, as I have said, with basic sciences themselves and go to the final goal that sustainable development. You will see, and I guess you've noticed that all this is connected to the sustainable development goals. The program will be, uh, will be made with a special care to obtain special speakers. And that's the priority. The, the members of the Academy and other people would be of course welcome to come but the focus will be on special speakers. We would like to have, let me be very frank, uh, at least, maybe it's too optimistic, but we'll see that at least 10 Nobel laureates. We would like to have a, a, a meeting of the leading scientists today and also a number of important policymakers. We consider that that's crucial to connect science of scientists and policy makers. As you know, maybe you do not know that, but I'm aware of that. This is one of the, one of the lacks of the present situation. Most of policy makers, I am certain of that, do not involve often scientists in their decision-making process. They uh, rely on governments, intergovernmental organizations, non-governmental organizations and business community. We would like to stress this, that scientists are important and they have to contribute considerably to uh, creating or to, to going to, to achieve the sustainable development goals. Thus, the conference will be open for everybody, but let me repeat that the focus is to, look, to collect an elite of today's basic sciences and policymakers, as I have said. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, actually, uh, I was uh, looking, uh, uh, there are not a specific question, but I saw a comment uh, uh, to something I was mentioning before, and it's uh, evident uh, to everybody in the academy that uh, we have uh, lots uh, of people that are um, men uh, and many uh, people from uh, Europe uh, and North America and uh, much less uh, women uh, and uh, people from uh, other continents. Uh, um, uh, anybody cares uh, to comment on that? Personally, I was very happy that uh, recently I was asked uh, to create a working group, uh, the working group that is uh, creating actually has created the draft uh, for the code of ethics uh, of our academy that is going to be sent in a few days uh, to the board of trustee. The board uh, is going to uh, elaborate on it uh, and send it all to the membership uh, so we could have uh, 
um, feedback and co-construe, uh, you know, together what is the best way to go ahead, uh, since we are so many also to understand our right, but also our obligation to function effectively. It, it took, uh, honestly, some time for me to create a, a working group, not large, that had the majority of women and the majority were not uh, white or from Europe or North America. We happily made it and work very well, but still it's true in my vision and also many other vision that we are not yet a representative, you know, in a more balanced terms of the sociogram. Anybody would like to talk about that and maybe would be symbolically meaningful that Mila would speak first. I'll be the representative then. It always lo looks like that. Luckily enough, I, I'm not the token woman anymore uh, as times are changing. The truth of the matter is, and the truth of the historical reality is, that the founding of the academy happened at the time that was dominated by male intellectuals, by the sheer fact that that's what the power structures were. That doesn't mean that we throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? That means that what those structures need is the transformation from within. They, in fact, um, if we're gonna be truthfully scientific <laughs> and artistically inspired and advanced, we have to be first and foremost dedicated to evolving. That's the truth of science. That's the truth of art, fundamentally. And in that sense, any practicing um, artist or scientist is internally, individually, and collectively developed, dedicated to development and evolution. In that sense, uh, the founding of the academy left us an, a tremendous intellectual responsibility and social responsibility. For us to be developing as an academy, as an international organization, we have to be truly immersed in the world context for which we're claiming to be the World Academy. With the changing times and the emergence of women, uh, diversity of social forces, diversity of regions, diversity of disciplines that have been birthed since the founding of the Academy. And of course, the inclusion of all, all demographics um, and intergenerational voices is vital. It's essential both to be in um, harmony and in stride with the world, but also to be truthful to the purpose and the mission and the vision of the Academy. So I can say that it has been wonderful to see the tremendous change in the uh, bringing in fellowship and members in fellowship that come from different parts of the world, that from different demographics, from different regions and different disciplines. And also it has been absolutely delightful to see that our programming is also reflecting the same kind of preoccupation going with the times as I think we have wonderfully seen and witnessed in the documentary that was created for this particular occasion. Thank you. And I, I read uh, Gary inviting uh, people to raise a hand uh, and also underlining uh, the, the social uh, grammar in the, 60 years ago that uh, the big majority, as uh, Mila also underlined, were men. Would you like uh, to uh, comment uh, or say more about that, Gary? And uh, we invite people that uh, want to put questions or make statements. You have to raise uh, the electronic hand, uh, please. Uh, I will just speak briefly and then Fadwa, I know, has been eager to speak. So uh, I'll just take a, a minute. Uh, she's in the question and answer function. She's raised her question. But all I wanted to say is just to build on that. Actually, to be factual, the, of the 48 fellows, 48 founding fellows of the academy, there was not a single woman. And in 1990, there were only 10% of our fellows were women. We're now at about 20%. And all we have to do is triple it. Uh, I mean, go up to about 60. And I think we'll be, uh, we'll be getting there. And certainly we made a good impact this year. And as I mentioned, uh, in this conference, where 38% of the speakers are women, uh, we, we had 40% in June. 
So we still have a good ways to go, but we're conscious of it and the Academy will be better as we do it. But why I know you've been waiting patiently, so. Great, well, thank have... you. I see that uh, Fadwa has a question uh, and also Jonathan Granoff, uh, and then there is a, a question uh, for, uh, uh, for another panelist. Uh, Fadwa, please uh, go ahead. I just want to, to make a brief comment on the gender issue, but my point is something else. I'm not that concerned about the gender issue. But the, um, I think the gender issue has to do with the change of attitudes of both men and women. And that uh, it's not a matter of having more women, it's a matter of having women also change their attitudes and take themselves seriously and go into science and make contributions and go beyond this um, everlasting feeling of victimhood. Just contribute, you will be picked up. I want to, um, to move to the point I want to make, which is something I, I'm, I'm asking the uh, was to take advantage of the presence of anthropologists who combine art and science. It's a very unique field because they take humankind and humanity way deeper than the 75 years that was is talking about. Because if you go deeper, and I said that before in Belgrade in that conference on education, that if you go deeper, you will find that we have been before through climate disasters. And climate disasters are behind the, um, the end of certain species. Climate disasters are behind uh, making it possible for Asians to walk across the Bering Strait and populate America, or they wouldn't have had any people. So uh, there are many aspects, scientific aspects, studied by anthropologists. If we go uh, thousands of years and even millions of years, and we have to take advantage of the presence of anthropologists in WAS, very few, I think there are two or three, and go deeper, than the 75 years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and then uh, uh, Jonathan Granoff uh, wanted uh, to ask a question. And then there is uh, a question for you, Stefan, uh, on uh, how you're going ahead uh, with your project. Uh, uh, please, uh, Jonathan. Yes, this is a question to Neboj. Ne ne Nebojsa, and I apologize if I didn't pronounce your name correctly. Um, thank you for you know bringing together scientists to to you know to bring technique to to solve problems. <laughs> I have a question. I believe that within the next two decades there will be kits available at a low cost that any hospital anywhere in which infants are delivered, it would be very easy. It will be very easy to take a swab of their saliva and get a genetic code, get their DNA. The argument from a sci purely scientific utilitarian point of view would be that that da data should be collected in a, central, in a central data bank. The power that that will provide a small number of people is unprecedented. We have seen in the United States recently the very fragility of legal checks and balances on the abuse of power. There are many countries in the world, China particularly, that has a purely utilitarian perspective toward privacy, human rights, and uh, fundamental freedoms. That power in that data bank will run up against those values very quickly, especially when you, in, when you, when you start looking at uh, quantum computing and bioengineering. So I wanted to know if, you, and if you're going to have within this gathering of scientists, any discussion of legal, moral, and ethical constraints on the extraordinary powers that we're going to see very quickly on the horizon. Okay, thank you uh, for, for the question, Jonathan. Uh, I uh, have said, uh, I have mentioned the lack of participation of scientists in policy making, especially basic scientists. But on the other hand, I'm quite convinced that, that the results of research and the application of results and the regulation 
must be kept under strict control of society as a whole, policymaking and all others. Thus, I'm not talking about prevailing of what scientists do, but about including all the stakeholders. My point was that the scientists must be there, but they, the, as I have said, and as you have mentioned, the application and especially the regulation must be strictly controlled by society as a whole, whatever that means. We'll be very careful because in the United States, what has happened, if you look at the Department of Energy and the budget, it was formed with that logic in, in, you know, in its formation and with it in its documents. But in the reality, <clears throat> its funding has been almost entirely uh, focused on military applications. And uh, the public is unaware of that. Uh, but hopefully, hopefully this will change soon and the Department of Energy will start focusing on sustainable energy, but it hasn't been. So it's a very delicate, it's a very delicate process. I understand that. Thank you, Vash, for the question. We must think about that seriously, about the mechanisms, how to control the application, as I have said, regulation. This is very important. Regulation has to be controlled also, do we know that? Thank you, thank you. Now, Stefan, can you please, uh, did you see the question? Somebody, I forgot them because I cannot see the question anymore was uh, asking you to answer this question. How uh, already underway is your Tao project? Uh, can you tell us? Yeah, well, I, I mentioned already some uh, concrete steps of the last two or three months. You know, I've been in contact with BITS and European Central Banks, also with uh, representatives of uh, developing countries. And in particular, this new technology we are proposing with blockchain technology fourth generation can provide additional power and momentum and how to finance SDGs. You know, it's, it's actually, this is not the format to talk about specific financial engineering and special um, tools, how to do that. If you're interested, please do not hesitate to contact me. I have the entire data the entire project, the entire tables available here. And do not hesitate to contact me on that topic. I think uh, it's very sure. exciting at the moment. Yeah. Uh, Stefan, uh, since uh, I think uh, some people would like to contact you, would you print uh, your email in the question and answer section? Your email. Yes, I will. F absolutely. Do not hesitate to contact me. We have all the stuff available in the next couple of months. There will be more stuff to come. We are, uh, I have a meeting with parliamentarians tomorrow and with regulators next week. It, there's, a, there's a huge urge to come up with a, con uh, a comprehensive financial schema and how to enable SDGs. It's not only about governance, it's not only about technology or mindset, it's about coming up with the right financial engineers to make all that happen. I think we came up with a very comprehensive setup of tools and mechanisms to make that happen. I'm happy to, to uh, type in my, my contact data. Yes. Thank you, Stefan. And uh, it's really exciting that uh, uh, actually, you know, the planet uh, is full of problems, but also is interesting. Uh, also, people come up uh, with a, a lot of solution. Uh, so it's not only that uh, we lack a solution, uh, we lack uh, also political will to implement uh, those solution uh, as, uh, as uh, we have uh, explored many times, uh, Gary and many other colleagues and friends uh, in uh, the free courses uh, we've been uh, offering uh, uh, <laughs> with the Academy and the World University and Inter-University uh, Center in Dubrovnik, uh, uh, I rem I'm reminded that, uh, you know, it's the use and misuse of power and uh, how much, uh, uh, you know, so many things they uh, find the barrier, although scientifically and economically, like a uh, full employment that, that Gary and uh, Ivo have been proposing for a long time, you know, have difficult to be uh, really applied, uh, but uh, they can be applied, uh, but uh, uh, there are some real barrier like uh, 
uh, people can communicate, uh, but there are so many prejudices <laughs> that uh, stop uh, the effective communication. Do you want to mention uh, any of uh, what you've been doing, uh, Gary, for the full uh, employment? Uh, it's been a few years uh, you've been uh, promoting uh, this important concept. Well, thank you, Alberto. I think there's a good parallel with what uh, Stefan is talking about, because we have been for years blinded by orthodox economic theory about even thinking about creating money the way we are now doing all over the world, this, uh, do this quantitative easing. It was blocked by theory, not by the potentials. And my, our argument and the work we've done in the academy is the same is true of full employment. Yeah. And we've had some wonderful sessions in December at the conference and in June at the conference. All of that's available online. And we've had testimony from very serious thinkers that it is fully possible, affordable. In fact, it's the cheapest thing we can do is to create jobs for everybody because the costs of unemployment are far higher than the cost of employing people. The social yes. costs, the medical costs, the mental costs, the loss of human resources, the social, uh, the political costs, we see the result of it in the US uh, mm -hmm. when the economic insecurity grows. And we have a lot of paperwork and I could refer people to our Cadmus journal, the back issues uh, in the section on economy and employment. We have excellent papers and if anyone wants to refer to me, I'll be happy to send them links. But I think the, the work of the Academy has centered on trying to break out of some of the conventional stereotype, the mental blocks that, uh, that conventional theory has prevented us from looking at the facts. COVID did that better than all our arguments could. It forced governments to break through the conventional uh, financing strategies and we've created trillions of dollars which have not been inflationary, but have to support people. And that's the approach that Stefan's talking about uh, for uh, the SDGs. And I think this is something that has to be done and is practical to do. Uh, and he has a book coming out shortly, which will spell it out very well. But thank you for the, the question, Alberto. Okay. Uh, we. Uh started the late uh, so we still have uh, 10 minutes uh, to go to complete uh, our panel and uh, i see uh, susan uh, clark uh, and uh, uh, i was seeing uh, eric uh, susan uh, did i miss uh, you wanted to share something uh, yes i do very very Please. briefly in the interest of time i want to go back to what alberto and mila said about the composition of the Academy and echo and take your invitation and make one or two very brief remarks. I'm personally less interested in the genetic composition of the Academy than I am in the quality of the ideas it embodies. I'm also quite interested in the clarity of the goals we're promoting. One way to talk about those goals, we're trying to create a commonwealth of human dignity in harmony with nature. And lastly, I'd like to say my third major concern is the timing and effectiveness of our actions, which are critical. So I spoke to goals, ideas, and actions and timing. I agree with Mila in that we need to be contextual. We live in the world of 2021, not 1960. And the Academy should reflect that uh, more so than it currently does. So I just want to close with fully endorsing what Mila said. Her comments were well articulated and I just want to echo and support those. Thank you. Thank you to you. Eric, uh, did you want to share something? Yeah, uh, I have uh, a question to uh, Stefan again. Um, do you have contact with developing countries? What they are think about the, the financing uh, with uh, cryptocurrencies? Uh, the SDG financing there. You know, the governments there, they are prepared to take this money and to canalize it in the, the SDG? 
Well, the, the big advantage of uh, a distributive ledger technology in enabling SDGs as one part of the entire argument is that you basically avoid illicit transactions yeah. and corruption. And this has huge impact on the real economy. And every country, developing country I've been talking so far is they're, they're, they're severely suffering from corruption, shadow economy, black economy, and illicit transactions. And they basically destroy the entire formal sector. So implementing DLT, distributive ledger technologies, in the entire financial schema as one part of our argument, basically not only avoids, but eliminates illicit transactions because blockchain can make the entire value chain transparent. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, there was a, a question and a comment uh, by Marahaji are you uh, able to express it uh, directly? Wanted to comment or to ask a question. This is the time. Yes. Please go ahead. I am in agreement with what we have been saying. Oh, thank Please you. Please understand. Thank you very much. I only thank say thanks to all thank my boss, bosses. Thank you. Then uh, there is another uh, question, uh, um, uh, and uh, one uh, comes uh, from our former uh, treasurer, Jehuda. Uh, the political leaders uh, and business executives are focusing on short termism, on short terms. There is uh, the need to have uh, the big picture and move to the long term. Uh, I think uh, we all agree. Somebody wants to comment uh, specifically? Okay, I'm in contact with Yehuda and uh, I know his approach, especially it comes to insurance companies and uh, having a, a, a large picture perspective. We've been included his idea into our report and it's a substantial part of the overall schema in short, in order to uh, gain long-term investment uh, there is specific financial engineering required to make that happen. And insurance companies do play a, a critical and important role because their initial business model is long-termism. Great. Thank you. Do you want to say something before we hear from Monif? Monif, in a moment, we're going to be with you. Yeah, I'd like to add to that because I think this is a good example of the fact that our disciplines have been so separated from each other that we've been pretending for a hundred years that economy can be taken separately from governance and politics. It used to be called political economy. And econ economists have been trying to build an, an independent model as if the economy exists independently and it does not. The reality is that an economy works within the frame of a political system. And the political incentives are for short-termism. And the, uh, they are reinforcing, uh, all of the policies and laws are reinforcing this short-termism. We can change that very quickly if the political will is really to build for sustainable futures. We can do it by the changing the pricing of resources. We can do it by taxing short-term speculative investment. The solutions are anywhere. What we have been doing in the, in the academy, and I go back to a comment that Ivo made in his opening remarks briefly, in looking for a human-centered economics, we insisted it has to be a transdisciplinary discipline. You cannot talk about economy separate from human rights or politics or eco ecology or society. And we're just trying to put the pieces back together again. And so this question just raises, uh, Yehuda's question takes us to the fundamental. We have to reconstruct our social sciences. There's only one science. It's a science of, only one social science. It's a science of human beings. And it has an economic, a political, an ecological, a cultural, a psychological, a technological, an organizational dimension. 
And as long as we keep these disciplines fragmented and separate from each other, developing different theories, different theories about the same thing. You talk to the economist about what is a human being and he talks about something totally different than the psychologist, <laughs> the theories of, of what human beings are and what motivates them. We need a theory of the whole. And that's what we've been trying to work on in our, our work on new economic theory is identify what would be the premises for a comprehensive integrated science of society and a human-centered uh, science of economy. Thank you, Albert. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, uh, Monef, uh, are you ready to put uh, your question and comment? Uh, maybe uh, not, not really, but uh, listening to uh, people, I oh, think- yes, Momir, <laughs> I was asking Mom. Oh, sorry. But uh, go oh. ahead. No, no, no. It, I don't care much, but just listening, listening to discussion. I am afraid that we don't appreciate what is the state of the world today, that everything has changed more fast than we thought. Nothing is going to be the same. And um, commenting on economy, I think the worst thing human invented is one subject economy. Economy is not one subject, everything is economy. And that's where we make uh, biggest mistakes in our life. Economy is everything. It can't be a single subject, no way. Especially with the things going on as they go today. We don't know what's going to, to, to be tomorrow. This virus has shown that everything has changed yeah. and future is not going to be Nothing is similar with the, uh, today's world, not past. I got a book published in quite a few languages with the title, Future Has No History. And we are talking too much on history. There is no history anymore. Future is completely unknown, very difficult to accommodate. And science has completely different role in the future. It is not going to solve everything. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now, Monif, uh, another of our uh, fellow that is also part of the World Sustainability Forum uh, that has a session uh, in this uh, conference. Monif, please. Thank you, Alberto. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, good to be with you. As you said, Alberto, uh, we have a session tomorrow, so I didn't want to actually contribute uh, to this session today and, and save all my good points until tomorrow. But uh, having heard what uh, some of my colleagues and friends said, I thought um, it might be worthwhile just to mention a couple of quick points to, to really develop what Gary said in his passionate intervention of a few moments ago. I think the year 2020, ladies and gentlemen, has been a turning point in history for the science, for the academic community, for politicians, for people who care about the state of our world. I think we have to really address a number of issues in our post COVID-19 world. Uh, business as usual cannot be the same logo, the same uh, framework uh, uh, in our post-COVID-19 world. I, I know that Gary mentioned the fact that our politicians in many countries in, in Europe and North America, as well as in the developing world, need to really um, uh, develop, build bridges with scientists, with academics. And when I say scientists, I'm talking about the broad stream of science and scientists. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed that there is a gap between uh, polity, decision-making, governance, and scientists. Many of our top politicians in the East and the West and the North and the South did not pay a lot of attention to the 
COVID-19 pandemic and the economic, social, health, and economic fallout of the pandemic, resulting in probably unnecessary deaths of people and the widespread of the pandemic. Um, so that is one level. I think the economy or economics, our economic models, whatever they are, in all countries need to be revisited again to make sure that the poor and vulnerable within our societies are not left to fight the pandemic fight on their own without support from other uh, people in society. Um, and, and thirdly, I think science has to develop the capacity to be more convincing to politicians and to decision makers. Um, not only to combat pseudoscience, the fact that many people around the world until this very moment do not realize how serious the COVID-19 pandemic has been and will be for the next few months at least. And also the fact that um, commercial interests have intervened in the hearts and minds of the people who develop the vaccines, uh, who seem not to have realized, not to realize until this moment that we're not talking about profit and loss as such in terms of getting as many people vaccinated as possible, but it's a matter of the survival of the human race. So I think all these issues have become critical, are critical, and need to be very much on the radar of WAS for the next year immediately and probably for the next five years or so, so that um, we really do not repeat the mistakes that we have all made in addressing the COVID-19. And as specialists tell us, this might be a reoccurring event that will happen quite more often now from now on uh, than it used to prior to 2020. Thank you. Thank you. And now, Peter Milan, uh, please, uh, Peter. Hello, friends and colleagues. Um, good to see you all. I just have a comment for Miller, um, just regarding the gender topic. I would hate to reduce the gender issue down to women experiencing the, the issue of victimhood here. I mean, last few weeks, Pitchbook, I don't know if you know, they released their results where they looked at uh, global trends or, and, and with a focus in the US of VC funding hitting a three year high, yet at the same time, funding to women led ventures in Q3 of 2020 hitting a three year low. Uh, I was moderating a panel at the World Economic Forum a couple of weeks ago, and we were discussing this issue. The WEF picked it up and they actually also uh, demonstrated results that showed funding through accelerators are less likely to give women funding than they are to men. In fact, the equity attributed to women-led ventures through the accelerators, men are 2.6 times more to get equity funding, whereas women are more likely to get debt funding. I think with the, the gender issue, we are facing a systemic social issue that's deeply inbuilt. And even Wes is like, Wes is boiling this down to like bias, which is something we should also talk about when we get to the media panel tomorrow and how that shapes perceptions. I had Ursa and Cousin, who's the former executive director of, of the World Food uh, Organization on my panel, uh, wasn't on my panel. I got her as a keynote for, for our event at WEF. And she was saying things like ducks hire ducks. <laughs> Her words. Um, but basically, you know, I think that this is something that we really need to integrate into what we're looking at in terms of um, a socially inclusive, human centric um, uh, way of restructuring or rethinking or relensing how we do finance, um, and that it needs to have a valid voice at the table and acknowledging if we're going to start with where we are right now. We need to acknowledge that this is a systemic problem. It is legitimate. Uh, there are a lot of powerful women out there with great ideas where there's just certain biases or systemic barriers that make it so much tougher for them to actualize or materialize their potential. And I just wanted to hear what you had to say about the systemic nature of the problem. 
Thank you so much, Peter. I mean, thanks for actually realigning something that I would like to um, point out as fundamental misalignment. Misalignment and uneven development. First of all, let's call it what it is and what you actually named it, it's structural violence. This is not a question of victimhood. This is the question of justice. And this is the question also equally of survival based on that justice, because there's no way of going forward without realigning um, uh, and, and achieving that socioeconomic and uh, political justice. There is no chance for us to survive going forward without this. So first and foremost, that's important to mention. Then another aspect I wanted to bring forth is the question of that misaligned development, right? The problem with development and what seems to be the discourse of even American dream, which is, you know, we all have equal opportunities, which we straight up know by statistics, history, experience, and all the current events is not true. So when you look at the intimate and personal domain, what happens with women, you tell them, you know, you can do whatever you want, right? As long as you take five more things on your plate. So you overwhelm them, overwhelm them, you exhaust them, you, you do that in, and isolate them in that sense so that in a very personal psychological way, this is the after effect of being even able to lift your arm to propel your ideas forward. On the collective level, you also have that kind of structural violence and exhaustion happening, right? Or muting in that sense. And then of course, going speaking of the future development, it's unthinkable, right? How we're gonna be limping um, or how do we even imagine walking forward, right? Straight up. So the, this question of misalignment, uneven development happens on the horizontal plane between certain countries between certain demo or among certain demographics uh, within between genders as well, right? And then in, 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 in any question of leadership and organizational development, it happens that way. So we have uneven distribution of power, uneven distribution of wealth, of food, of opportunity, of health opportunities, you name it, right? But also we are fundamentally misaligned to speak to the questions or comments of Momir and Jonathan and Stefan and others. We're misaligned on the vertical plane as well, where you have this rampant scientific exploration, wonderful technological advances, right? But as Jonathan pointed out, for militarized ends, right? So what we don't have is equal development or harmonized development or whole development, holistic, whole and integral development so that we have mindset, mindsets changed, right? That we have consciousness changed, that we have that kind of development that is all inclusive, that is integral, that can take us forward. So these are some of the things that I want to point out and certainly for some of us women, the development goes hand in hand with certain pr cultural privileges. Um, you know, for example, some of us, even in the pop culture, are riding on the military power that has opened up new markets for certain pop stars. Why are the voices of talent, capacity, and possibility and ideas not open equally to everybody? Second point I want to make is to bring in a commentary from John Bunzel. I don't want that to be missed, Alberto because I touched it and then it went into answered questions, speaks to this. John Bunzel said, are, are any evolutionary biologists involved in uh, WAS? They are the people who understand how evolution overcomes competition bottlenecks. And this is relevant also to the global cooperation now, so sorely needed. So if we can bring in John, I would really appreciate that because he and Pita and others are addressing the fact that our laws, institutions, organizations and overall economies of our life are organized and founded on biosocial conflict, on the fact of exploitation, extraction, overpowering, right? That biosocial conflict where the global concerns are not in alignment with universal laws that guide all life and planet. So we have a conflict between social constructions of which Alberto always speaks, and natural laws that, and life intelligence that guides all life forms. And in that sense, between the globe and the planet. 
that's untenable. They signal me that our time uh, is off uh, and that uh, we need uh, to announce uh, that there will be in a moment uh, a 15 minutes break. Uh, I want just to say that uh, since uh, with the various uh, uh, contribution, I see a red thread that uh, what was true 60 years ago, our founder is still compelling to us. Uh, and still uh, we see that uh, mechanicistic, reductionistic uh, thinking uh, and uh, behaving uh, creates a uh, great uh, damage. Uh, yesterday was uh, the atomic bomb. Uh, today, they are still atomic bomb of very nature that deflagrates uh, and bring uh, damage and imbalance uh, to human ecologies. Uh, and uh, it's true that uh, we are in a pandemic uh, of a vast proportion that show how crazy we are to think that being egotistic and just take care of vaccine for ourselves is gonna solve the problem for us. Totally crazy and wrong. We are all together, either we win <laughs> the challenge of uh, relating with ourselves, uh, others uh, and the world in a sustainable way, or we pay the price as we've been paying. Other pandemia have been uh, going on uh, and still will go on and we need to find vaccination for racism, injustice, sexism, bigotry, and so many other pandemia. And so we need uh, to work all together and enrich each other. Thank you for everybody. Ciao, ciao.